People often think C-SPAN is funded by the federal government. In fact, we're a nonprofit organization that receives no government funding. As news consumption changes, you can help ensure the future of C-SPAN's unfiltered coverage of national government and politics. We hope you'll consider making a tax-deductible contribution that will support our daily editorial operations. To learn more, visit cspan.org forward slash donate. This week, C-SPAN was on the road in South Carolina, New Hampshire, and Nevada catching up with presidential candidates as they made their pitches to voters. We'll hear from Republican hopefuls, including Vivek Ramaswamy, who talked about gun rights and went shooting with voters in New Hampshire, former President Donald Trump in South Carolina at a holiday weekend football game, Nikki Haley at a town hall, also in her home state of South Carolina, and... Democrat Marianne Williamson talking with voters at a town hall in Reno, Nevada. We'll also talk to Jessica Taylor of the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter about the latest in 2024's U.S. Senate races. But first, a few minutes with Caitlin Byrd. She's a senior political reporter with the Post and Courier newspaper in Charleston, South Carolina, who told us about recent campaigning in the Palmetto State by former President Donald Trump and former Governor Nikki Haley. South Carolina is an important state in the Republican primary lineup. You've got Iowa, that's going to kick it all off. Then you've got New Hampshire, where we expect the field to winnow a little bit. Nevada's doing its own thing. And then you come to South Carolina. And here on the Republican side, South Carolina has a really robust history of picking the eventual Republican presidential nominee, with one exception, in 2012 with Newt Gingrich. Um, But that was... That was just that one time. So uh, Republicans are quite proud of themselves. And Nikki Haley herself has said that she sees her path to the nomination coming down to a head to head here in her home state of South Carolina. And now that her former uh, her former uh, contender uh, and fellow South Carolinian Tim Scott is out of the race, um, she definitely sees this as her home turf, not Trump's. So far, the latest polls haven't shown all too much movement down here for former Governor Nikki Haley. The latest The ones that we've seen from Winthrop University show that Trump still holds a very strong majority here with 52 percent of likely Republican primary voters. But Nikki Haley's inched up to about 17 percent, followed by Ron DeSantis at 12. So she is making that movement upward. And we are seeing some serious momentum here in her home state. But again, that margin that we're seeing between Trump and the rest of the pack is just so large. But Haley's team continues to say, hey, it's a slow and steady race. We're in it for the long haul hall and we're going to just keep uh, keep withering away at that lead. That's kind of their strategy is slow and steady wins the race. And they're just trying to take everyone out one at a time. What do you see their strategies, their specific strategies in South Carolina? What are they like? Well, Nikki Haley talks a lot about how this is home. I mean, she talks a lot about growing up in Bamberg, South Carolina. She leans a lot on her personal biography. But now that we've seen things taking a turn, particularly on the world stage, we're seeing her lean into more of her identity as the former U.N. ambassador Haley, as opposed to former Governor Haley, if that makes sense. Uh, Donald Trump has continued to come and hold very large scale events thinking rallies, but he has incorporated some one-on-one time. I'm thinking back when he came to Somerville, South Carolina, and he actually stopped at one of his campaign offices, which is a much more intimate setting than we're used to seeing him in. Usually he really wants the big stadiums, the sold out crowds, um, the big numbers on the board for him. But he did take time to do that and then go to a gun store. So he is kind of starting to incorporate those more retail politics that we're used to seeing. He was handing out popcorn, for example, on Saturday at the football game. But it really was, you know, a quick in and out for the former president. And he's really relying on that power of the incumbency, even though he's not technically an incumbent this time. He is leaning on that title of former president, Donald Trump, and really leaning into being the president and saying, you know, acting like I am the nominee and waiting. You love me. Everyone loves me. Let's go. What kind of influence does uh, Governor McMaster have in GOP politics in South Carolina? He was with the former president this past weekend. Well, Governor McMaster is a longtime 
a Republican, and he actually used to be the state GOP chairman here, uh, just for a bit of context. So he was actually the chairman when Tim Scott was running for county council here in the Low Country. So uh, Henry's a very influential. He's known a lot of people here through the years, but it also came as no surprise that he appeared alongside the former president at the game on Saturday, because within hours after Trump making his bid official last year, Henry McMaster was giving him his endorsement. And if we go back in time, back in 2015 and 2016, when Governor McMaster was Lieutenant Governor McMaster, he was actually one of the first statewide elected officials in the country to endorse Donald Trump and had the pleasure of introducing him at the RNC later that year. So Henry and Donald Trump's relationship goes way back. In many ways, that appearance together on the home field was kind of a punctuation point in their relationship. And how is it that they were on the field? They literally got on the field. Henry McMaster was a really key player. And according to reporting done by my excellent colleague, Nick Reynolds, we found out that it was actually Governor McMaster who had requested this special moment uh, at the 50 yard line for the former president and himself to stand and wave to the crowd, which my understanding is that's, you know, a little bit in contrast from what we saw in the Iowa in-state rivalry game that Trump was in the crowd waving, but getting that time during halftime of this major game, uh, you know, it did prompt a lot of cheers from the crowd, but you can hear scattered boos in the video too. So there's, we'll have to wait and see how donors and, and longtime supporters of the University of South Carolina react to this because as governor, Henry McMaster is also um, an honorary member, if you will, of the board of trustees for the University of South Carolina. It is our flagship state research university here. So uh, I, I think there will be more to come on that front as we continue to see what the impact of that appearance will be. You and your colleague wrote a story earlier this year that you hadn't seen a lot of the candidates, but is that changing? It's slowly starting to pick up, but we are still in that sort of awkward season, right? Everyone just finished their Thanksgiving. Now people are starting to look ahead to Christmas. Um, So I think we are starting to see more visitors down here in this presidential race, but I expect it'll tick up more after we get past January 15th in Iowa, because some candidates, I think, are going to make the decision about what, how much time do they want to spend in New Hampshire versus how early do they want to come and start spending significant time here in South Carolina before February 24th? But I will say that, uh, for example, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will actually be with us on Friday. So they are coming. They haven't forgotten about South Carolina. But I think when talking with Republican activists and leaders around the state, there had been a hope that by moving that calendar date a little bit later, that South Carolina was going to have her time in the spotlight. So that moment will come is what they're all hoping for. But there is a bit of mild disappointment that they didn't get to see more. There was news made this week about an endorsement for Nikki Haley, the uh, Coke uh, network. Can you talk about what is the Coke network and why that endorsement matters? Yeah, this is a huge, huge boost for Nikki Haley. So I've heard it said many times that presidential campaigns don't end because candidates run out of energy or ideas. It's because they run out of money. And to have the Koch Network, which was founded by Charles Koch and his brother David, these are multi billionaire conservative powerhouses. These are mega donors who can be widely, wildly influential. And the thing with um, the flagship group that actually made the formal endorsement is that they also boast having a robust network of grassroots activists. So we're talking not just top down in terms of big dollars coming in and financial resources, which can mean everything from sending mailers, boosting her or or going after her her rivals. We're talking TV buys. We're talking digital contacts. We're talking phones. We're talking door knocking. So this money can really fuel things in a way that a campaign alone could not. So to have that extra injection of support, both financially and on the ground, is going to be huge. This group, um, Americans for Prosperity Action, has already knocked and called more than 6 million voters. And part of their strategy for helping make the case for Nikki Haley is trying to do that magic thing that is so important in every election, which is turnout. And one of the strategies that they have said they're going to do is go to likely Republican general election voters and really try to make sure that they are going to vote in this primary, which could be make or break for Nikki Haley. 
Nikki Haley picked up another nod of support on Wednesday from J.P. Morgan Chair and CEO Jamie Dimon. Here's what he said at the New York Times Deal Book Summit, urging donors and Democrats to support the former ambassador's GOP presidential primary bid. What do you think of the, the, the two leading candidates right now? Oh, God. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you're not going to tell I me. I did come out and make a nice statement about Nikki Haley. You did. Even, uh, you've been talking to Nikki Haley. Very liberal, yes, I have. Even if you're a very liberal Democrat, I urge you, you know, help Nikki Haley, too. You know, get a choice on a Republican side that might be better than Trump. And is that your view, that it's anything but Trump? I, I would never say that, you know, because he might be the president. I have to deal with that, too. And, you know, but... <laughs> And here's some of the local coverage of former President Trump's visit from WLTX Channel 19 in Columbia, South Carolina. President Donald Trump, as we mentioned just moments ago, arrived at williams Bryce Stadium at the Hall of Captains around 7.15 this evening. He was surrounded by security. He made his way through the crowds who had gathered to see him. During halftime, Governor Henry McMaster and former President Trump made a brief appearance, a little less than two minutes, on the midfield. 50-yard line, waved to the surrounding crowd before walking back off. Now, there's always traffic around the stadium and in Columbia on game day, but today presented a different set of challenges with the former president being in town. So many things are making it feel different. It's Clemson, Carolina, there's a certain uh, big presidential candidate rolling in town. It's, uh, it's crazy, and everybody's excited for this game. I am, too. A different feel for game day, according to USC student Connor McGushin. He was one of thousands of fans that traveled to williams Bryce Stadium Saturday for the annual Palmetto Bowl. Part of the buzz around game day was news of former President Donald Trump making an appearance to watch the game. Zachary Hurst traveled in from Gaffney and says having a former president in town was another reason he couldn't miss it. Well, I was already, you know, wanting to come. Uh, meeting any presidential candidate or former president, regardless of political sides, is a great honor. And I would absolutely love the honor to meet him or any former president. Next, we're in Bluffton, South Carolina, with Republican presidential hopeful Nikki Haley. Politico reported she was initially supposed to hold a town hall. It ended up being a rally with more than 2,500 attendees, and hundreds more stuck outside because the venue reached capacity. Here's part of her remarks there, where she outlined a path to victory in the GOP presidential primary. We have too much division in this country and too many threats around the world to be sitting in chaos once again. And let me tell you, America has an amazing ability to self-correct. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom to know where up is, and we're there. The one thing I don't think we can survive is a President Kamala Harris. If you look at the recent polls, Donald Trump beats Biden by three to four points. I beat Biden by 10 to 13 points. This isn't just about winning the presidency. This is about winning governorships up and down the ticket, winning House seats up and down the ticket, Senate seats. This is about getting our entire country turned around. We can do this, South Carolina. You've done this before. You know how to do it. And we're going to be coming back home. We'll be here. <laughs> I so want to take this guy on the road with me. Get your coat, buddy, because we're going to Iowa and New Hampshire. So what's the status that we have? So right now, God help us, we've got another debate next week. You're going to see, my guest, three candidates on the stage. So the stage is getting smaller. When the stage gets smaller, our chances get bigger. And so what you're going to see is you're going to have three or four people going into Iowa, and a couple are going to drop. And then you're going to have a couple of people going to New Hampshire, and another one's going to drop. 
And then I come home to South Carolina. We are now in second place in Iowa, second place in New Hampshire, and second place in South Carolina. We just have one more fellow we got to catch up to. And I'll remind you, and I want to be very respectful, that we are on the USC Beaufort campus. How'd it work out for the Gamecocks having Trump show up? <laughs> Not so lucky for the Gamecocks, just saying. Go Tigers. So we can do this, right? We know how to do this. But in order to do this, it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from every single person in this room. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know. Don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't play in this primary. We need you. Someone asked me why I was running when I first announced. And I said, you know, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter who just got married. And I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. And I'm doing this for my son, who's a senior in college. And I am tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That is not us. That is not America. And for the first time in America, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we have. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We have a country to save. But I'll tell you this, if you will join with me, we can get this done. <laughs> Y'all have been great, but I'm going to take you back to this short history. I defeated the longest living, longest living legislator, longest serving legislator in South Carolina. He might have been the longest living. I don't know. <laughs> longest serving legislator in South Carolina. And when I ran against him, people laughed at me. And I got to work, and I earned their support, and we won. When I ran for governor, like Tom told you, I ran against a lieutenant governor, an attorney general, a very popular congressman, and a state senator. I was Nikki Hu. I had 3% in the polls. I had the least amount of money. But I worked South Carolina like no one else, and we won. When I got to the United Nations, they said I didn't have enough experience. And I got to work, and I took the kick me sign off of our backs. I have been underestimated in everything I've ever done. And it's a blessing because it makes me scrappy. No one's going to outwork me in this race. No one's going to outsmart me in this race. And now, a look back at campaign ads of yesteryear. Two ads from the 1980 presidential primary season that were running during this week in 1979. Gallup had just released a national poll showing Ronald Reagan solidly ahead of his Republican competitors, including former President Gerald Ford, Senators Howard Baker, and Bob Dole, and former CIA Director George H.W. Bush. Here's two commercials from two of those candidates, Reagan and Bush, hitting on themes of national security and inflation. Ronald Reagan spoke out on the danger of the Soviet arms buildup long before it was fashionable. 
He's always advocated a strong national defense and a position of leadership for America. He has a comprehensive program to rebuild our military power. We've learned by now that it isn't weakness that keeps the peace, it's strength. Our foreign policy has been based on the fear of not being liked. Well, it's nice to be liked, but it's more important to be respected. President Carter, what you don't seem to understand is people are really fed up. If we don't get tough with inflation, we're going down the drain. If we don't build up our military capability, we're going to get stung again. America is in trouble at home, abroad, with itself. The job has to be done now. This country is not ready to give up its future. Similar themes are playing out in the Republican presidential primary in 2024 as well, where former President Donald Trump has maintained his commanding lead in a 538 average of national GOP primary polls. Here are two ads aimed at those voters, one from Donald Trump on his handling of the economy and another from Nikki Haley on her national security stance. President Trump made us safer, wealthier, and more secure. Under Trump, prices were low and groceries affordable. Trump took on China and won. Jobs were coming home, and Trump secured our border. But bumbling Bidens made a mess. President Trump's conservative agenda will clean it up. He'll crack down on the border and ban communist China from buying up our farmland and property. President Trump, a strong leader to keep us safe. Make America Great Again Inc. is responsible for the content of this advertising. China's dictators want to cover the world in communist tyranny. And we're the only ones who can stop them. Nikki Haley, the conservative China fears most. You are the only Republican candidate who claims a China plan. You've got a strong, long record of being tough against China. Nikki Haley, strength in a world of chaos. Communist China won't just lose. Communist China will end up on the ash heap of history. SFA Fund Inc. is responsible for the content of this advertising. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and his wife Casey were also on the campaign trail this week. She talked with a number of talk radio shows based in Iowa, including this one where she talked about the experience of taking her children to campaign events and how she reacts to criticism of her and her husband. Uh, I guess coming after dad is probably used to by now, but they've come after you. Uh, it just if, if you just search your name, I'm not going to go through these stories. Uh, the Casey DeSantis problem, uh, somebody once said. Uh, knives out for Casey DeSantis. I could go on and on and on. They've come for you. Is your seven-year-old aware of that? No, you know what? I mean, they're still so young. I mean, they're obviously not on electronic devices. They do not have social media. Mm-hmm. I, they need to be out of the house before they're ever on social media, according you know, to me and the better half. No, they, they don't. They understand that you know, their dad is governor, and they understand that he's running for president of the United States. Uh, but as far as like getting into the weeds of a lot of this stuff, no. But we bring them with us on the campaign trail a lot. One, because, you know, they grow up so quickly, right? You blink your eye. They're in college. I don't want to miss any of this time. But also, I think it's very important, and you can never start too early, to tell the kids about what we're doing and what we're fighting for. We are fighting for the very foundations of this country. If we don't stand up now and fight for what we believe in, we're in jeopardy of being the first generation to lose the idea of America. I mean, my son, it's so funny. So we're on the bus and we're traveling around in Iowa, and he's a huge FSU fan, Florida State University, and they were playing. And when we were on the bus, we either missed the national anthem or it, uh, they didn't play it, one or the other. He want, he, he, so he's hugely patriotic. He had everybody on the bus stop what they were doing. He played the national anthem. He even had the bus driver putting his hand over his heart because we had to play the national anthem. But, I mean, it's important. He understands, too, you know, the honor and sacrifice that our people in uniform have put forth to be able to protect our liberties. And so it is important that they understand that. But as far as taking the hits, like, listen, Simon, I do not care if they come after me. It does not bother me one bit. Because at the end of the day, I want to look myself in the mirror and say, did I do it right? When the good Lord gives you an opportunity to fight to make a difference, what do you do with it? And I'll tell you, frankly, nothing can be worse than hearing the words, you have cancer. And that happened to me two years ago. 
And I was able to fight through that. So if they want to sling mud at me, go for it. It's not going to make me back down. Probably mm. only going to make me want to work harder. Um, all right. Well, let me ask you another question. Because obviously, you, you, you've uh, uh, been next to uh, the governor for uh, uh, quite a while. Uh, they keep coming after him. Uh, does it upset you when they come out when they come after him for like personal stuff i understand policy stuff oh he's totally wrong about this particular policy but then it's the personal stuff they try and unpack and they don't care if they make it up if it's true they don't care if someone was doing that to my wife i'd be fuming (laughs) how do you deal with that well, I, you know, the, the governor can roll out of bed and he gets attacked no matter what he does. And, uh-huh. you know, listen, at the end of the day, if they have the merits of their case, they would want to litigate that. But they don't. They call names and they try to say things and they try to distract. And, you know, they don't have the argument on their side. I mean, listen, they can look to the state of Florida and they can see that he led boldly. He never backed down when he was given the opportunity. And let me tell you this. People were telling him when he won that first election in 2018 by 32,000 votes in a state of 22 million people, hey, you better not rock the boat. You better just, you know, bide your time because this is a swing state, you know, typically determined by hanging chads. And he rejected that. He went out and did what he thought was right, protected parents' rights. He stood up for the innocence of our kid. He had law enforcement's back. And he ended up winning by the largest margin by any Republican governor in the history of the state of Florida. And I think that that shows you can bring people together and that bold policies, not pale pastels, as Reagan would say, that leads to success. And so, yeah, I think people are going to throw shade your direction. We both reject that. And I think it goes back to at the end of the day, do you sit on the sidelines? Do you complain? Do you just look for a different path forward that might be more politically advantageous in the moment? No, you stand up for what you believe in. And ultimately, you do what's right. And who cares what people say about you? Next, we're on to the Granite State Indoor Shooting Range in Hudson, New Hampshire. That's where Republican presidential hopeful Vivek Ramaswamy and his wife Apoorva met with voters and shot both pistols and long guns. You think so? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. See, I aim in low every time. It's pretty good. That's all right. So there's there's obviously a little difference between where the optic is and the barrel. Yeah, is. yeah totally. Yeah, you're going you to adjust to that. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You go one more round? Yeah. yeah. Another try. Yeah. Wow. yeah, it's pretty good yeah. stuff. You want to try it? Yeah. Sure. All right. You, you go first. You wanna, right. Did you shoot that AR? It's the same thing. Does she have one more? Do we have one more for her? Yeah, I can grab it. You do? Okay, okay. Safe, safe right now. Yep, still unsafe. So safe down. Huh? Well 
Well done. You should see me with the rifle. Yeah, I know, that's right. Yeah. I got my new addition. You want to try the pistol? <laughs> sure. You want to shoot the pistol first? It doesn't, doesn't really matter. Whatever, right. whatever works. Let's try this. Okay, just, so it's going to be real pistol. easy. I'm going to put the mag in there for you. I'm going to do the slide. Safety on. All you got to do is push that down. There should be a little red dot on it. Put that dot on the target. Pull the trigger. And you're going to want to hold it for the whole position tight. This hand is going to move up perfectly in the gap right there. And your thumb can rest right on there. Okay. And then just find that red dot in there. Put on the target. Okay, safety's on. Whenever you're ready, just push that down. Okay. Keep the muzzle down range 100% of the time. Never turn around. Okay. Yep, so just like that. So you can, whenever you're ready, take that safety off. Okay. Yeah, and hold it nice and tight, nice and tight. Okay. So just put that in there. Did I, did I just hit like the top thing over there? Yes. Okay. Move your thumb down a little bit. Okay. Move your thumb down a little bit more. Okay, yeah, that here? should be good, yep. Safety on, put it right on the table. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. The first time. It's a lot harder. Yeah. <laughs> Is that? It's actually hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so it's already loaded. Yep. So, yep. So, nice and tight, put this thumb right over here. So, you're going to want to hold it thumb over thumb. So, move your thumb right, right behind it over there. Right there? Yep. And so, safety on, whenever you're ready, just put off the safety off of the thumb. Safety's on, right? So whenever you're ready, pop that down and off. So right, so I'm gonna take it off for you. Okay. All yeah, right. That's the safety. Got it. Yep. So now just put the dot in there. Put that right on the target. Hold it nice and tight. Good yeah, stuff. And just make sure you can throw that right on the table. Awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah, Good stuff. Great. All right. I think we're getting to sit. Yeah. We'd, have, we'd stay here all day. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah. Good seeing you. Great. Good seeing awesome. you, man. Nice Thank you for showing us how to do this. Thank you, man. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Oh. You're going to do great. Hey, keep up the good work. Thank, Thank you for it coming. I appreciate you. it. Good meeting you. Thank you, man. Good shot, man. I appreciate that. Thank you. Good seeing you. Share broadly. A polo was all over the tape, man. Take it off. Pretty happy with the no misses with the set. Not not too many. We did all right. We did all right today. It's good. It's good. Exactly. Exactly. How you doing, man? Good. I'm Mike. It's great. Good to see you. Thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you. I We're not going to stop till we get the job heard, done. I haven't heard anybody talking anywhere close to what you Thank you. Great Sharpie. You know, I believe God put each of us here for a purpose, right? So we're going to do ours. Thank That's you what I believe. Much. We're not going to stop till we get this job done. Love to have you. Nice to meet you soon. Thank you. Thanks can for we get on. you to sign this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And if you can, too. And I'll hold this up. Can Thank we, you. Can we take a picture down by the new display? Let's do it. Let's do it. Yep. Good uh, shoot. Love it. Nice. Should we take Thank a should we take a little uh yeah. take yeah. Little picture? Alright, yeah, that was fun. You got Emily in there too. Come on. That's cool. Thanks, man. Cool. Where at? Down here. Down here, let's do it guys. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Did you do all right today? Yeah. 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 Y
Nice grouping. Good to see you. Good grouping. Yeah. Yeah. We have you. <laughs> Appreciate that. You're welcome. Let's take one together. All right. <laughs> Get in here, Brock. Rick, I'll make sure to send these. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Pretty happy. Oh, go yeah. Control, right? I was pretty. <laughs> exactly. Very controlled. Yeah, control. I like that. I like that. That's, that's what I mean when I say it. Yeah. That is. That is. In a grouping. Yeah, I appreciate that, guys. Yeah, thank you. It's good. I have a driver's license in Massachusetts. I have nine carry permits from other states, and I still can't make it out of New England without going through someplace else. <laughs> well, it's it's crazy. It's New Jersey or whatever else is any kind of nonsense they have. It's sort of that you have you have a bunch of different yeah. you know this this kind of hundreds of dollars to yeah I mean the constitutional carry law the constitutional carry law to land it's not that complicated yeah ATF is a big part of the problem but that's on my list of shutdowns and then move the you know basic background checks to the U.S. Marshals we can get that job done right it hasn't been corrupted in the same way appreciate you coming out today man thank you thank you thank you guys I appreciate it it's good to be here guys thank you thank you man appreciate it where do you live again. Uh, I actually live in Miami, but my dad, my dad's the owner. Visiting so your parents? Oh, you're for Thanksgiving. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. Keep up the good work, man. Yeah. Proud of your dad. and Proud had a great you. time, guys. Thank yeah. you very much. It's nice meeting you. Thanks again, Great meeting you. Thanks for coming it. by. Thanks, good luck. It's an honor. Thank you. It was an honor, guys. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you. taking care of us. Yeah. Franco and what's your name again, man? Forrest. 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 I appreciate you guys. Thanks, we'll come back guys. sometime. <laughs> I, that's what I would be into. I, I, we, we've done that I've before. That. That's fun. You know, they're teaching, they teach kids that in the schools these days, too. Oh, you do? Oh, good. Good, good, good. Oh, it's a good... We, we, uh, the amount of strength it takes... We do some in mass. We'll get a whole group that. together for you to talk. I would love that, actually. I would love that. We've done it before. Right. We have a good time with you. Yeah. Take care. Take care now. Can we take a call? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm praying anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Tell them I said hello. I appreciate it. Pray for us. I appreciate it. Now, on to the Democratic presidential race. Vice President Kamala Harris was also at the New York Times Dealbook Summit this week, where she was in conversation with columnist Andrew Ross Sorkin. You can look at where we are in the economy today and take credit for the following things, I think, or you would, you would like to think. Uh, near record low unemployment. Mm-hmm near record high housing prices. Oil prices are coming down. The rate of inflation is slowing. Uh, Near record uh, stock prices are actually uh, quite high. Pass the CHIPS Act. All of these things. And yet despite that, and you know this because you look at the polls, former President Trump not only on a national level uh, appears to be uh, beating the uh, Biden-Harris ticket, but uniquely in those five of the six key swing states, that seems to be the case. And so I'm trying to understand the way you think about when you see these polls, what you think is happening and what you think the American people feel. Well, it's good to be with you, Andrew. Good to see everyone. Uh, So most of the setup of that question related to the economy, so we can discuss that first. But there are many factors that the American people consider during election cycles in the midterms and then um, recently in Ohio and Virginia proved that point. Uh, when we look at the economy, I appreciate you recognizing that we have accomplished quite a bit, especially when we reflect on where we started in January of 21, when we, of course, were looking at record unemployment. Uh, we were looking at a crisis that was global in proportion. Fast forward to today, we have actually uh, dealt with inflation in a better way than most advanced economies. We have had record unemployment for an extended period of time. Wages have um, surpassed inflation in many ways. So we have seen great progress. And I think the American people know it on some level, but these are also macroeconomic measures and don't necessarily connect with the heart and the experience and the feelings of the American people. Uh, For many Americans, prices are still too high. And we still have work to do to address that. And we've been doing that in a number of ways, capping the cost of insulin at $35 a month, what we are doing in terms of student loan debt, over $120 billion in forgiveness, what we're doing to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices. So the work is happening. And frankly, when you look at polls, I will tell you, 
If you pull, insulin at $35 a month. If you pull, Medicare negotiating drug prices. If you pull what we have done with an historic investment in an existential crisis, which is the climate crisis, when you pull what we have done on gun safety, polls incredibly So that's so interesting. So on individual issues, you're absolutely right. And our challenge is just to let folks know who brought it to them. That's a big part of our challenge. So when you're surprised when you see the polls? individual accomplishments, they are very popular. When you see, when you see the, what do you, what do you think when you see the polls? Listen, if I listened to polls, I would have never run for my first office or my second one. And here I am as vice president. Democratic presidential candidate Dean Phillips, the retiring three-term House member from Minnesota, was also in the news this week. A super PAC supporting his challenge to President Biden's re-election made a major ad buy in New Hampshire, calling for a new generation of Democratic leadership. Let's watch. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans. 2024 is different. Trump is winning. It's time to pass the torch. I am the Democratic candidate who can win. It is time for the torch to be passed to a new generation of American leaders. Pass the Torch USA is responsible for the content of this advertising. Next, we're on the outskirts of Reno, Nevada. It was there that Democratic presidential candidate Marianne Williamson met with voters at a town hall, answering questions and taking pictures with them, some who drove from out of state. Nice meeting you, Yeah, Robert. very nice meeting Thank you. you. I, your words have definitely gotten me through some hard times. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank that you. Thank you. I hope you'll help spread the word. Yeah, and all your policies and everything, it just speaks so clearly to me. So. Thank you. We yeah, just got to do it now. Talk to your friends, get on social media, for you're sure. a young guy. For sure, for you sure. You a voter here in Nevada? Yes. I need you. Yeah, yeah. John Solomon. Nice meeting you. Yeah, I'm very politically active. Yeah, apparently so. I did a lot so. of uh, canvassing, and, and then I, was, I worked as a, a lobbyist for basically environmental issues and social justice issues. Oh, gosh, I hope they help me. At the state level. Thank and, you. And, and the brick wall of, of the mining industry in this state is just really scary. I mean, even because, like, I, I work with the Democratic Party. I, I mean, I, I, I have to um, to get anything done and they're scared of the mining industry like we brought we were trying to all we were trying to do was say that the pit lakes they need to not make any more new ones and we couldn't even pass that no, of course not and that's you know that's water in the desert that they're destroying and so yep 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 so and, and there was a constitutional amendment it might be on the ballot this year you know what Jen Kuger said I heard him say this, and he's a friend, and this was long before he joined the race. He said, somebody's going to break through. The way I look at it is we're just leaning against the wall. We're just leaning against the wall. That wall's going to come down. It might not come down in a particular project you're doing or a particular project I'm doing, but just, we're all just leaning against the wall. Right. I mean, because I was a Bernie Sanders delegate at that convention in 2016 when they pushed back on us so hard. They never counted our votes. They just said, oh, this is how many delegates there are. They, and so I understand. Stand. I deal with these people all the time. Well, I hope you'll consider becoming a delegate for me. I would. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Please sign up I'm on my mailing be, list. Uh, and a, uh, the person that runs the uh, uh, whatever they're called. De- they're not delegate caucuses selection? anymore. Yeah. yeah, the delegate selection. Uh-huh. I'll be on that. I'll be working with that for sure. Great, great. Yeah. Okay. No, you want to give me your card? Because I'll have somebody specifically reach yeah, out to you. I don't have a card, but I can give you. know what? Write to me at Marianne uh, at Marianne2024.com. I will. What is What's your name? John Solomon. Okay. Put on the in, in big letters uh-huh. on a subject line, Nevada, John Solomon. Right. I'll remember you. Your delegate s- yeah. selection. Thank you. Yeah. Need that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Who is going to take a picture for me? Thank I just moved here uh, from Chicago, and I'm registered here now. You're registered here. So you know I'm what? So if you were registered in Chicago. Let me ask you, though, because I need a lot of help mm-hmm. in Illinois. Yeah. Do you have no, any? I'm registered here. Oh, now. I know that. I know. Yeah. I heard yeah. you. Do you have friends or family that you know support me in Illinois? Oh, we, yeah. Really? Yeah, we have uh, most of my family is all in Michigan. That's where I grew up. That's enough. I need, I, I need, yeah. oh my God, you're in yeah. all the states I need. Yeah. So I was, I grew up in Michigan. <laughs> my family's mostly all there. And then my fiance's family is mostly in uh, Illinois. Okay. So, because we and need. And of course, my own my friends. and. We need the help with getting delegates. Mm-hmm. Um, 
If you think that there are people who maybe be helpful, would you write to me at Marianne yeah. at Marianne2024.com? Yeah, I'll write it down. Um, I'll come back and I'll write okay. it down. Just Marianne at Marianne2024.com. Okay. Just your first what is your name? name? Ryan Mills. Yeah, Marianne at Marianne2024.com. What is your name? Ryan. Ryan Put Mills, Nevada, yeah. Ryan. And you'll remember. Yeah. Okay. All right. There, sorry, there was people behind you. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You're going to have some uh, All right. Thank you. Yeah, I'll send, I'll send that. Thank you. Go on. Thank have a good you. rest of your day. Thank you so much. I have to show you. This is in 2020 when you were at um, Swill Coffee four years ago. I was there There's yesterday. Me and you. This is you when you spoke at the yoga studio in Sparks. And then this is, I did this with another volunteer. This is Earth Day in Reno, Nevada. We had a display talking about you and why people should vote for you. <laughs> I need an update picture now. She's going to take one. As I can say, I knew her. Hi. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. There you go. So what do you think? Do you think that... How do you feel about it the second time around? I, I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, yes. It's I like, gotta, you know, you gotta get more people to know who you are. I need your help. That's because they're blackballing me on the. Yes. They're doing everything they can to block that. Yes. But you know, things I think on C-SPAN today. It's all. But I need your help. I need you to talk to ten people. Yes, I'm gonna talk to ten people. Thank you. And sign up to volunteer, please. Thank you so much. Yes. And I'm taking their photo. Hi, my name is Tiffany. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'd like to know how to. This is my daughter, Serafina. So nice to meet. Me too. Now, how old are you? And I, are you finished growing yet, you know? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. We'll see. The lucky girl. We'll see. Let me tell you something. If somebody says she can't win, say even if she doesn't win the state and she wins delegates. If she wins delegates at all, it's a statement. If she makes delegates at all, she might get enough to speak at the convention. You know well, what I mean? And we talked about how it just that even it's it's elevating the conversation. And but we need to do, but we need to check. But, but only if I'm if I get in. That's the thing. People said I elevated the conversation last time, but then once I, I was out, then so that's they, what I want to know is how I get involved. My husband and I are filmmakers. Like, how do we get involved in being part of your campaign? Okay. Can I can I just get on your yeah, website? This is what you do. Go to the volunteer thing. Okay, go to Nevada. Volunteer in Nevada. I'm in California, though. I live in California. Oh, you live in California. Yeah. Well, I'll need help in California. You can write to me at Marianne at Marianne2024.com. Okay. Who is your husband? He's here? He's not. Okay. Yeah. Uh, write to me at Marianne at Marianne2024.com. Okay. And We're going to get like, a quick photo. Thank you. Okay. I'm taking theirs. All right. <laughs> Nice thank you. you, thank you all. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. for all you're doing. Thank you so Appreciate much. It. We're going to do a lot together yeah. over the next yeah. few months. Okay. Jessica Taylor is the Senate and Governor Editor at the Cook Political Report with Amy Walter. Jessica Taylor, first, before we talk about specific Senate races, remind our viewers of the landscape heading into 2024 for the upper chamber. This is an incredibly difficult map for Democrats. You have to think back that these are senators that won in 2006, which was a massive Democratic year, um, Bush, President Bush's second midterm election, which Democrats won back the Senate um, in 2012 in Obama's reelection, and then in 2018, which was another huge Democratic wave year. And so not only are they facing a very different electoral landscape this year, that means that we have senators that are up in that have sort of defied the political odds over the past few cycles that are up in very red states like Montana, John Tester, uh, Sherrod Brown, Ohio. And so overall, you have 23 seats that Democrats are defending compared to just 11 for Republicans. But you have not only those two seats that, you know, in Montana that Trump won by 16 and uh, Ohio that Trump won by eight points twice, but you have uh, other states that uh, Trump carried in 2016, Biden carried in 2020, like Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin. And then you have another state, Nevada, that's also very competitive. And so uh, it, it's just an incredibly difficult map. 
where Democrats are essentially entirely on defense and the margin for error is very small, um, non-existent really, because at this juncture, we now, now know that uh, Joe Manchin of West Virginia is not running again. He faced an incredibly uphill task, even if he was running, but and that essentially, that's a seat that has been ceded to Republicans now. We, when, when Manchin announced, we moved that into the solid Republican category. So that's a really a surefire pickup. So now, if, even if they don't, even if Republicans only flip that seat and they win the White House, they will have won the Senate. It will be a 50 50 tie. Um, but if Democrats are able to hold on to the White House, then they, uh, have, they have to hold on to essentially all of their incumbents now. Which races in particular? I mean, you mentioned some, but have anything has anything changed recently? Where are you watching intently? Oh, this this week we are changing one race rating, and that is we are moving John Tester, who now with Manchin out of the picture, um, rep- is the Democrat running in the toughest seat on paper. Um, who you know again has won three times against some weaker Republican candidates. Tester is probably, though, the strongest incumbent that Democrats have. His approval ratings are still in 60 percent. And there is sort of a looming, you know, Republican primary there that could be very consequential. And, you know, we have to look back to 2022 when we think of these because Republicans lost some very winnable races because of weak, controversial candidates. And there is the potential that this could happen again. And so I think that's why. Republicans that I talk to, there is sort of a cautious optimism, I think, given the friendliness of the map. But they also know that there is a real potential to sort of fritter away what should be a golden opportunity. And for Democrats, they've essentially got to pitch a perfect game again. And they did that in 2022. Can you do it twice, though, is the question. Um, so I think John Tester, when we put out our initial ratings, um, again, just because of where his approval was, we kept him in lean Democrat. But I think at this juncture, Manchin's departure puts the onus even more so on the fact that they must keep this seat. Now, National Republicans have gotten behind uh, Tim Sheehy, a wealthy businessman and former Navy SEAL, a Purple Heart recipient um, in this contest. Uh, but, but there also is a probable primary looming with Congressman Matt Rosendale, who lost in 2018 to Tester and his polling has shown would be a much weaker nominee. Now, uh, Sheehy is unknown in the state, but has been spending a lot on ads. So he's raising his name ID. There are two polls from friendly organizations backing Sheehy that have shown him in the lead. Um, you know, Rosendale has struggled to raise money in the past, has not had, does not have a lot of money in his current house account. So I think that's giving Republicans some optimism. And that is one reason that it looks like Sheehy is pulling ahead at least or has a very good chance in this primary. But so we are moving this race to toss up. But I think if it were Rosendale, that's the nominee that would cause us to reconsider our rating once again. Talk about Pennsylvania mentioned the 2022 cycle. What's happening in Pennsylvania this time around? I mean, this was the Republican hell seat the Democrats were able to flip. It was an open seat then. It's much more difficult, though, because you are running against an incumbent, uh, Bob Casey, um, whose father was governor, a well-known politician in the state. But the, but the Republicans believe he has some weaknesses that, you know, sort of the, is the Casey name as golden as it once was there in the Keystone state. And this, I talked about the potential for Republican primaries damaging them. This is a place where they look to avoid one. Um, David McCormick, who ran in 2022, um, was a former Bush, worked in the Bush Treasury Department, um, uh, venture capitalist, hedge fund executive, very wealthy. He finished just about 900 votes behind Dr. Oz in that primary. And I think Republicans and Democrats agree would have been a stronger nominee and that race against John Fetterman could have looked very different. Um, he is running again this time with a promise to put millions of his own money in the race. And there really isn't a primary. He's sort of the anointed candidate with the state's establishment and D.C. establishment behind him. So this is really going to be, I think, a really high spending affair, a very top race. And of course, we know that it's a presidential battleground as well. But Republicans are optimistic that actually McCormick might have the ability to run ahead of where Trump's margins might be weaker, particularly in the Philadelphia suburbs. How is it looking in Ohio for incumbent Sherrod Brown? I actually think Brown might be the most vulnerable incumbent. Again, on paper, it should be John Tester, but I think that Ohio, you have that state, you know, used to be the perpetual um, battleground state, as when Ohio, as with the nation. But now you have Trump that have won, has won it eight, by eight points in both 2016 and in 2020. Now, 
you know, Brown is a political survivor. He sort of has this populist bent to him that has been very well received there. And of course, we also look at how the issue of abortion is played there with issue one, um, with them solidifying abortion in the state, protecting abortion rights. Um, Democrats see that as a harbinger in their favor. But I also think that's a referendum they probably would have rather have had on the ballot in 2024 as well. Um, now, this is a place where there is a primary and it could get messy, but Republicans actually are happy with um, any of the candidates, they say. So the two leading, there's three leading candidates, but I think one has a more difficult task. Uh, State Senator Matt Dolan, who ran last time, he's more of the moderate in the field, has been a critic of Trump. Um, Secretary of State Frank LaRose is currently leading in polling. Now, this is a very early March primary, so we'll know who is here, here pretty soon, but he, um, is not as wealthy as the other two candidates. So where his money comes from, we will have to see. And then you have wealthy businessman Bernie Moreno. Now, Trump has not endorsed in this primary. He's hinted that if he does endorse someone, it would probably be Moreno. So that could really change the dynamic here. But I just think Ohio is is very, very volatile just because it is no longer a swing state. It is one that certainly tilts red. And West Virginia, you mentioned it at the top. Well, who now who's running in that state? Who yeah. are these candidates? Well, we don't know for Democrats yet. And I think whoever it is will sort of be a sacrificial lamb. I don't think you'll see a strong Democratic challenger because really Joe Manchin was the Dem- West Virginia Democratic Party and there is no bench. Um, the front runner in that primary has been Governor Jim Justice, who's term limited this cycle, very popular, um, wealthy coal magnets, um, you know, but there's questions about his business finances and money that he owes and different things too. Um, but you've already had McConnell and national Republicans get behind him. I think this primary was going to be more consequential if he was running up against Manchin, but I think now this takes less pressure off of it. So the club for growth has gotten behind Congressman Alex Mooney. They're starting to really spend heavily in there. Um, remember the justice was first elected to, uh, as governor um, in West Virginia as a Democrat and then switched parties at a Trump rally. So there is some conservative distrust a little bit of there, although Trump has endorsed justice. And I think that matters, especially in a state like West Virginia. So I think justice is still the odds on favor, but this is a primary that still could be interesting, but I think, the importance of it, 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 Republicans aren't as worried about it because essentially whoever wins that nomination is going to be the very clear front runner to be the next senator from West Virginia. What are Republicans' chances in Arizona? Arizona is my asterisk race because I think it is just so interesting. While we got answers about what Joe Manchin was going to be doing, we still don't know what Kirsten Cinema is going to be doing. That was his sort of other partner in crime in the Senate um, of the sort of centrist caucus. And of course, she actually left the Democratic Party last year, a year ago, um, to become an independent. So she faces a really daunting race of running by yourself. Will she have party support? There's a question of what would Democrats do? Because she was going to lose in a primary to Congressman Ruben Gallego, who is the clear front runner for the Democratic nomination. And then you have Republican Carrie Lake that is the clear front runner in the Republican path there. She ran for governor last time, lost, although she has disputed that. She's an election conspiracy theorist, has been a very vocal Trump ally. Um, I think that Republicans... But but because it's a three way race, anything can happen. If Cinema runs, her path is just so narrow because she has to win over um, a, a large majority of independents. And actually, polls show her taking more from Republicans and from Lake than than, they, than she does from Democrats. So if I think if if Cinema does run. Um, she could pull off some of those moderate John McCain type Republicans from Lake that she has, I think, sort of, um, you know, ostracized in a way, at least in her first campaign. Now, there are indications she's trying to run a more disciplined campaign, stay more on message. But even when I talk with Republicans about that, there's sort of a wary skepticism there that can she really do that um, in, in a way? So this race is hard to handicap until we know is it going to be a two-way race or is it going to be a three-way race either way it's very competitive so it's one that we have rated in the toss-up column a reminder this program and all of c-span's campaign 2024 coverage can be found online at cspan.org campaign